welcome welcome to uh welcome to our uh, latest air tree session um we're excited to have you here uh we're going to um have people filtering through the waiting room as we go um but um but in the interest of time this is all going to be recorded so uh we're going to go ahead and uh and get started because we've got a lot to cover today um uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm James Cameron. I'm a general partner here at Airtree. Um, and we, while we can't see all of your faces here on Zoom, we can see all of your names and uh, excited to have everybody in the group. We've had a, a really awesome group of uh, primarily founders, but also operators and people in sales organizations right across the country and, and, our, and our friends over in New Zealand. Um, and we're excited to, um, to have a session today all about sales and sales leadership and go-to-market generally. Um, there will be plenty of opportunities to ask questions, pop them in the chat. Um, I'll try and tackle them as we go. So I don't feel like you have to leave them to the end. I'll try and make sure that we cover as much as we can. And if I can't, I apologize. Um, but do feel free to pop into the chat, say hi, tell us where you're from. And um, uh, we'll have people uh, answering questions that I, uh, I miss out on. Um, so today's session is particularly exciting. Um, uh, I'm going to introduce the person on my left here in just a second. Um, we, if there was ever a fantasy league football style um, competition for sales leadership, um, I think Stevie Case, who's sitting next to me on my left here, would be right in the mix of the uh, the top uh, team. Certainly my number one draft pick. So I'm really excited to be talking to Stevie today. Um, Stevie has uh, worked for a multiple of companies, but two in particular are genuinely iconic companies when it comes to uh, growth and particularly go to market. Um, uh, she's currently uh, the CRO at Vanta, which needs no introduction, but I'll, I'll, I'll ask Stephen to introduce you in a second. But um, Vanta is a huge global success story now um, in B2B um, enterprise technology, um, selling to customers right across Australia. Australia is a huge market for Stevie. That's why she's down here with the team. Um, comes to customers like Atlassian, Dovetower, Constantinople, Joyous, Askable, and I, I know this because I'm on the board of Constantinople, so I see a lot of the output that um, uh, uh, that Vanta and the, and the team helped them with. Um, so you're probably familiar with them already. Um, and if you're not, um, Steve will uh, we'll, uh, um, we'll, uh, talk about them in a second and, um, and talk a little bit about her background. Uh, before that, though, uh, Stevie was um, on the uh, was doing exactly the same thing for Twilio, um, which was another iconic company with a very very different sales motion. <laughs> yes. Um, so I think that's why I'm particularly excited to sort of rip this these sort of two uh, companies apart in particular and sort of understand some of the different learnings around different product, different go to market motions, etc. And you grew that from pretty much nothing to a thousand person sales team and four hundred billion bucks in ARR. Um, and before that, even um, to put aside the fantasy league football for sales leadership, um, Stevie was probably in the fantasy uh, league uh, for e-gaming long before that. If you go through Stevie's Wikipedia page, it's a wild <laughs> ride. So long before she was a sales leader, uh, she went by the nickname Kill Creek um, and was a pro uh, esports gamer, particularly around Quake. Yeah, right? Quake, the original Quake, the first one. It Very is, old school PC games. It is. It, so it, it is worth going to the Wikipedia page <laughs> just to go on that ride that I went on uh, last week. Um, Steve, can I can I ask you before we dive in? a little bit of background, maybe talk about banter as well. Yeah. Um, and then we're going to dive into a bunch of questions that I know have come through around go to market and sales leadership. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. This is great fun. Um, I'm having a wonderful time in Sydney. I'm already in love with Sydney. Honestly, it's my first time visiting. So excited to be here. So Vanta, we've got a good team on the ground here, you know, as a global organization. So we're a Series B company. Headquarters are San Francisco, but we've got presence in San Francisco, New York, Dublin, London, and then here in Sydney. Um, we've got roughly 20 people on the ground here in Australia, which we're really excited about. We are known for our automated compliance platform. So what people probably know us best for is compliance that doesn't suck too much, which is the tagline we started with. We have helped thousands of startups to tackle compliance for the first time ever. And our founder, CEO, Christina, is uh, incredible. She's a product leader. And she did not know about this space as a product leader, tried to bring Dropbox paper as a product to market. And she encountered this objection from the legal team. She was trying to bring paper to the existing Dropbox customers. And their response to her was, well, you can't 
like add that to the contract that your product's not SOC 2 compliant. She's Googling SOC 2, like <laughs> what is it? And uh, realized how onerous some of these things were and how, how much work had to go into getting through a SOC 2 audit. And I think it was very eye-opening for her, this idea that you're in this like incredibly forward-thinking tech company, but you're filling out spreadsheets and like screenshots of things to prove to a very non-technical auditor that your product is secure mm. and that you're managing compliance. So that was our origin story. Um, incredible product market fit that's been off the charts and we've grown pretty dramatically. So uh, founded in 2018, flash forward to today, we do much more than that. We now consider ourselves a trust management platform. We help companies manage risk of all kinds in their business, vendor risk, access risk, um, all sorts of third-party risk. And we still do automated compliance. We support lots of local standards, like here at Essential 8 is a great example of something we help folks with. We're now 500 people. We just announced at the beginning of the year we're, we're above 100 million in ARR. And a team globally is about 500. So we've grown a lot. I've got all of go-to-market and uh, in my organization, it's about 200 folks globally. So, wow. but it's been a lot of fun. I've done the pre-revenue journey as well. I've done startups where I was the first non-technical hire to start to build go-to-market. So this, mm. is, this is what I love. And the business has been incredibly successful. I mean, you guys are at a $1.6 billion valuation for around a couple of years ago. Yeah. You know, from pretty much nothing to, to that in a short couple of years. It's really generally one of the um, enterprise uh, software success stories of the last five or six years. Um, and largely down to... Um, having a fantastic product, but yeah. also being able to layer over a fantastic go-to-market team strategy, and, and that's what we're going to get into today. But um, but before we do, I, I, I know I know this pain point so um, so vividly because so many of our companies go through this process, and yeah. if they haven't, they will soon. Um, all of our software companies, um, all of the founders of those companies, I've always thought have these two random numbers that are sort of imprinted on their mind. One is one is the number eighty-eight thousand, which is um, a, a, a million dollars of ARR divided by 12 for M MRR. And everyone sort of, <laughs> for some reason, knows, absolutely remembers that one. And the other one is 27001. And you can remember that without, if you've ever been through an ISO certification, that mm -hmm. number will be imprinted in your mind. It's such a horrible process. Yes. But it used to be, I remember coming to most of my company's offices and there was just manila binders and binders full of documents that was uh, helping um, the uh, compliance teams get their certifications. And that is just essentially what you guys are trying to replace. And what you That's exactly muscle. right. Yeah. It, yeah. We want that process to be as painless as possible. We also want it to be useful. So, you know, it is about getting that done faster and more efficiently, but it, it's also about making it meaningful. You know, one thing uh, that is very painful and real about many of these audit processes and the compliance standards is historically, they've been a point in time check. So, mm. you know, you are uh, attesting that at this point in time, the things you are saying are true are indeed true. So you can say today that I've got multi-factor authentication enabled, but what's to say it's on tomorrow or it was on a week ago. And that's one of the beautiful things at the heart of Vanta is that we integrate with the core systems of a company and we do continuous monitoring. So mm. we can show that in uh, real time that those things are actually true and they remain true. So we really think it's a great way to modernize and make more meaningful all these compliance standards. ISO 27001 is a great example. It's also been so interesting because when Christina started the company, um, you know, for a company that's incredibly successful, she got a lot of early rejection and early pushback um, from VCs who thought like the SOC 2 market, the ISO 27000 market, like, you know, it's something you do later, maybe it's not that big. Mm -hmm. And by modernizing that process, she made it much more accessible for mm. people to approach ISO or SOC earlier in the journey. Mm. And we actually find now that often with startups, we will be the first purchase. We sometimes are like the first purchase after incorporation, because when you approach compliance earlier in the journey, it's actually much easier. Mm. So you set the baseline and then it's simple from there. Well, I'm just looking through the list of um, uh, participants on here. We, uh, I think this is this group will be primarily skewed to companies that are somewhere in that pre-seed to series mm -hmm. B, primarily founders or sales leaders. So, um, and one of the things I always um, am conscious of whenever we um, ask people on these sessions, 
who um, are at the, at the the peak of their powers in a company that's uh, a long way ahead of them, yep. is um, it's sometimes hard to imagine yourself back in the shoes of where you were sort of pre-product market fit in some mm -hmm. cases, trying to do a lot of founder-led sales and trying to build the initial parts of the go-to-market. Um, so I want to sort of take you back there. Love that. Um, and it could be with Twilio or it can be with uh, Vanta or it could be with any other mm -hmm. experiences. Walk us through what it was like and what were the sort of the first sort of six to 12 months when you got into these roles when it was still really just the founder selling themselves yeah. and how you thought about building out a sales process. Absolutely. So the, the company I was at actually just prior to Twilio is a great example of this. So I joined as the 16th employee, the first non-technical hire. So at that point, uh, very much founder-led sales. There was no uh, support, success, sales, anything. And so coming into that situation, you know, we were doing founder-led sales, but didn't even really have pricing, didn't really have any structure around go-to-market. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for me coming in, I that's actually my absolute favorite scenario to be a sales leader in. Um, you have to be extremely creative. I think, you know, mission number one, if you're a founder in that situation, you really have to think hard about what kind of person you want to put in that seat. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of common mistakes that I see there as I advise early stage companies that I've seen made in the past. And the most common mistake is getting dazzled by a great resume. Mm -hmm. You see somebody with a lot of logos and it's like, oh, well, surely they know what success looks like. The truth is the sale, when you're trying to transition from founder led sales to something that is um, led by a salesperson looks incredibly different than somebody that's got big logos on their resume is, is going to know. So the profile you want to look for is much more entrepreneurial. Um, we call it sometimes a renaissance rep. Mm -hmm. And it's somebody who's maybe like probably had one or two sales jobs. You definitely want somebody that knows what it looks like to be on a quota. But you want somebody that knows how to hunt, that knows how to generate their own business, but can also really put the mechanics of deals together. So mm -hmm. In this company that I was at before, right before Twilio, as I joined the founder, you know, I was basically shadowing the co-founders in every single customer interaction, because at that point, there's no playbook. Mm -hmm. The only real way to sell in that scenario is to be able to speak like the founder of the company. Mm -hmm. So as a, as a salesperson, you want them essentially mimicking the story as if they are a co-founder, as if they are an owner of the business as well. Mm -hmm. So tons of shadowing practicing the whiteboard over and over and over, and then essentially bringing somebody in that's creative enough to be able to like help you define what should the pricing be? What is the value proposition? Where are you gonna find that perfect ICP and start to define who actually sees value in your product? So it takes a lot of creativity. It looks a lot more like an entrepreneur than a salesperson in many cases. And in your experience, when when you find that person and, and, and they get into the seat, and you in this case, um, how long does it take before or, or, how, before you start to scale that when you're in there trying to really understand how the sales process works? Um, do you build a team around you or is it really just sort of one or two people that really trying to help build a go-to-market strategy before you start to scale that? Yeah, advice would be you want to start small and it's going to take longer than you would hope or expect. You should expect that ramp for a salesperson is going to take probably six to nine months before they are truly capable of telling the story in a effective way. And, you know, they, they've got to get like all the subject matter expertise, all the story as a founder would tell it, and they've got to adapt to all the market conditions. So the ideal setup is it's always risky to hire just one. You know, you hire one person, it can be very hard to tell mm. if they're doing well or not doing well, why? It, it, you can attribute it to skill, you could attribute it to market, maybe you've got the pricing wrong. If you put two people in, in sales, then you've got comparison points and you can start to think about like, what are the attributes of the more successful person? What makes that a successful pattern? And then start to emulate that. So my advice would be two, but not more. And I wouldn't start to add salespeople until you really feel like you've got something repeatable. Mm -hmm. That's another extremely common failure mode for founders looking to build go to market is you, know, you have a really technical founder, for example, who hates sales reasonably. Like a lot of people do not enjoy selling, mm -hmm. but it, that resistance to doing those initial founder led sales and instead thinking you're going to bring somebody in who's going to figure it out and do it for you. Uh, it is the worst possible thing you could do. You know, like founder has to have a certain amount of repeatability to start to show that to a salesperson 
And then I wouldn't expand beyond the two mm. until you're really comfortable that those folks can drive repeatable success. Mm. So you don't want to experiment. If you throw people into a go-to-market scenario where there's not repeatable success yet, it's just a recipe for, for lots of pain. And, and how long in, in your experiences has the founder still been involved in those sales discussions? It is still like years. Mm. Like it, it takes a long time to successfully make that transition. And it is the single most important thing you can do when you bring on salespeople is remain involved as a founder. And, you know, you should think of it as, you know, a spectrum that you're going to shift on of like when you first hire those salespeople for the first probably three months, the founder's still going to take 100% hmm. of the load in the customer meetings, the prospect meetings. That should start to shift down over the coming weeks and months that follow. And then hopefully within six to nine months, that person can be 100% independent. Mm. But it, it is just uh, really risky and ill-advised to suddenly think, oh, I've hired my salesperson, have them listen to a few calls or attend a few meetings, and then suddenly like off you go, go sell. Mm. Uh, it just does not work that way, unfortunately. And I, I'm going to, in a little while, I'm going to get into some sort of really tactical questions around how to find those sort of people, how to yeah. hire them, what to ask, et cetera. But let's, let's keep it sort of at the high level, sort of strategic layer. You know? um, we've sort of talked about the transition from founder led sales to the beginnings of building a sales mm -hmm. team. Talk to us about the transition between from having a couple of Renaissance salespeople through to starting to scale the go to market. What are you looking yeah. for? What what efficiency metrics? What organizational uh, maturity are you looking for before you really press go and start really ramping that up? Yeah, I, I think the key is you want those two reps to start to feel kind of overloaded, almost like they cannot handle more scale, and you know you want them feeling like momentum and success. And, you know, one mistake I often see at that point is like founders will want to very reasonably define a quota and you should define goals. Goals are very important for those first two reps. Um, the mistake is when you get a little too obsessed with like what is an industry standard quota and what's mm -hmm. normal and like, oh, uh, we're selling to SMB. So let's have a million dollar quota per rep. Oh, well, my people aren't making it. Mm -hmm. That might not be appropriate at that stage. The single most important thing you can do at that point is get really clear on what you want your sales reps to achieve. It might not be dollars. It might be that you want them landing a certain number of logos in a given month or whatever it is. Whatever it is, set that as a very clearly defined goal. Mm -hmm. Have that goal defined within a short period of time, like especially early days, I really like a monthly goal mm -hmm. because you don't want things to go too long. If you give somebody an annual goal, everything gets backloaded. So mm -hmm. keep it short. And then once they are repeatedly able to achieve 70 to 80 percent of that goal, mm -hmm. that's the point at which I would start to think about adding more. You know, when you get to a more scaling sales team, we like to think about 80 percent of the team making 80 percent of their number mm -hmm. as a healthy organization. You have to get past a few reps before those kind of metrics are, are, are really meaningful. So mm -hmm. like I think about that 70, 80 percent, if they can deliver that on a regular basis, you've got something pretty cool. healthy that somebody else can then replicate. And then and you trigger something in my mind is that you, how do you think about the um, balance between um, uh, incentivizing for outcomes versus actions? Because uh, there's a lot of activity yeah. that a sales team can do that may or may not lead to outcomes, but it's also important. It is extremely important. I, I really like activity in the early days, especially if you have kind of a pulse on what the right activity is. And by activity, that's, that's what are we talking Be about? Be like before? literally, like I, I would I would not necessarily think about activity in terms of like a number of emails. You can think about it in terms of a number of calls potentially. Mm -hmm. I really like activity around like maybe a number of meetings, mm -hmm. you know, uh, because it is hard to know what the outcomes might be. And so many things other than that person's skill could guide like the outcome of all those meetings. Mm -hmm. But if you're just trying to land logos in its early days, you could say, you know, as a as a sales rep, your goal this month is I want you to set 20 meetings and I want at least 25 percent of them to be in person. Mm -hmm. That's a great goal. And that's something they can control. It also then goes back to you can see if that person has sort of the energy and the will 
And then you could start to assess skill. It's really hard to assess skill based on outcomes when you don't yet quite have product market fit. So yeah. activity is a great way to do it. And that's and, uh, that's one of the questions that's come through on the chat is um, uh, is the inevitable question they have in that early stage, which is sometimes things aren't working because there's a product market fit question. Mm -hmm. Sometimes things are working because their sales models not working. Yeah. How do you try and diagnose between the two of them in the early days? And, you know, it sounds silly, but you kind of got to trust your eyes and ears. Like, I think that... If you actually remain involved in the sale and you're in the meetings, you can see if it's good or not. You can see if that person is telling a good story, if they've got command of the interaction. Um, and, you know, what I would really be looking for, especially in those early days, the, the core skill among salespeople is discovery. Yep. So do they ask really great, insightful questions and do they then uh, get out of the interaction the right information? Mm -hmm. If they can drive that, the rest of it is like mechanics or pricing and it's fixable. And, you know, I would trust, trust your own sense of the quality of that person's questioning and their interaction in the moment and their ability to tell a story. If they're good there, it's probably something else. Mm -hmm. And then it gives you a chance to diagnose if it's, you know, whatever it may be, maybe the wrong ICP, maybe the wrong pricing. Yeah. And, and, and for these Renaissance reps that are discovering and uh, it's a, it becomes a two-way information flow from yeah. your customers back into your product organization, yeah. how do you, um, from a tactical perspective, how do you get that information that they're hearing on the front line of customers back into your product org in those early days? Yeah. I mean, the best case scenario is using tools like Gong or others to record calls. You get great summaries out of that. Like you can do AI driven summaries now that are incredible and really clean. So our, our organization at the scale lives on Gong. Like we are constantly pulling insights out of that. You know, aside from that, I would be looking for that sales rep as one of their key responsibilities to be summarizing those learnings. And, you know, the best way to formalize that would be for them to, if they can't record a call or it's in person, have them take notes. Those notes should be shared. You know, I think a mistake that is very common at that point is sort of like the sales rep is off running their process. They've got notes. Those notes might live in drive, but they're like not yeah. going anywhere. So you got to have a way to surface them. And then, you know, it, can, it doesn't have to be fancy. Like it can just be like every time I have a meeting, I email the notes to everyone. But like that kind of sharing has to be a part of the cadence. We also right now, one thing we do is we're actually doing a weekly async notes with my team, which we found great as a remote organization where everybody just does a like it's, sometimes it's a couple of sentences, sometimes it's a couple of paragraphs, but we write in the same document once a week and we share insights there. It's a great way to sort of iterate and learn. I would be remiss, and I, I partly asked that question just so I could give a blatant plug to one of our <laughs> portfolio companies, a company called Source, and, and many of you on the, on the line will know this company. Um, they're a CSH company trying to solve exactly that problem. That, that two-way communication flow from sales or frankly anyone customer facing mm -hmm. back to the product team is such an important piece of um, customer need discovery. It's really tough to do well too. I'm glad to hear they're trying to solve it. You know, AI we, unlocks a lot of it. it. It's huge. Yeah. Um, so, so you mentioned it, um, a couple of questions ago. Um, this question around um, ICPs and mm -hmm. and and what do, what what strategy do you apply to like SMBs versus enterprise? And obviously, I think that's probably one of the key questions that any founder is yeah. going to try and tackle um, when they're first um, thinking about building out their go-to-market. You've worked with teams that have vastly different products and selling to enormous enterprises all the way down to tiny, tiny organizations. Mm -hmm. um, walk us through some of the things that um, when you're working with founders, you help them guide them in one direction or other around ICP uh, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a model on how to get to those customers. Yeah, this is a fun one. And, you know, is it, I've had, I think, really unique experiences here. Twilio being a great example. You know, Twilio was the consummate example of like a PLG business that was super developer centric. So lots of SMB. When I joined, my mandate was to help build the enterprise business. So mm. it's like, how do you sell APIs that are consumption based in an enterprise? And we went through this entire process of defining what does it look like to contract for something consumption based in the enterprise in a way that actually worked. Mm. Um, but really, like whether it's at that scale or at, at the very early days, I think the the key is to get to what is the value of your product and and who realizes that value and putting math around it. Mm. Like I think this is where people um, sometimes go off the path. There's a like the cool factor or something is fun to use or it increases you know productivity you got to quantify it um this is something we're doing really heavily right now at, at vanta it's like 
we help people get compliant and unlock revenue. Well, we need to quantify how much can we unlock, how much more quickly through automation. The more you can get to that math, that's got to be the thing that drives who cares about this, who's going to put budget against it, and you got to have a handle on what metrics it's going to move for that persona. Mm -hmm. So that math is one piece. The other truly is I think that deep down, a lot of founders have like an empathy and a sweet spot for a specific profile of buyer. Mm -hmm. And they should like think about what that is for them mm -hmm. and then orient their product around that. You know, if you're somebody who's really passionate about uh, startups and developers, mm -hmm. Don't think you're going to build that thing and then go sell it in the enterprise. Like do what you are passionate about because that's going to drive a lot of the activity. So it's got to be a combination of that art and science. And that's um, and that starts and ends with the product, right? You yeah. Can't, you can't force a go to market um, a motion that doesn't no. work for that particular product. And Australia, I think Australia has an interesting dynamic here because in many cases we Australian companies have been very good at product led growth. A lot of the really outstanding companies that have come out of this market like Atlassian invented mm -hmm. the product-led growth effectively and so a lot of companies have come through and fed that but I think I've, something I've noticed is that companies that have a product which is frankly an enterprise focused product um, yeah. they try and use a product-led growth model on top of it and it just falls falls flat so how much of that is the early sales leaders just having to get in and understand the product as well as the founders do to try and build a a, a, a uh, go to market that reflects it. Yeah, I mean, I just think you have to be incredibly thoughtful about once you get to that value, how does that person expect to buy? What is the process for that profile buyer to buy from you in a normal world? If you think you're going to reinvent how people buy, like good luck, some people do. That's a very hard path. Yep. I think the easier path is to really think about, you know, if you've got something that is an enterprise product where there's value for an enterprise buyer, when you have to consider that you're going to have to get through a lengthy procurement cycle, there are going to be requirements as a part of that. You're going to have to have certain features and functionality that an enterprise buyer requires because mm -hmm. the truth is um, when you're selling to a small company, you're selling to one person, mm -hmm. maybe two. When you're selling in an enterprise, you're selling to like dozens of people because you've got your buyer, your champion that champion probably isn't the person who actually has budget authority. And then you've got procurement and you've got legal and you've got a security team and you've probably got to convince several dozen people to buy that product. Mm -hmm. So there's much heavier investment that has to be made there. Um, another mistake I commonly see there is people who build a great product that is enterprise ready. Um, but there's like this mentality of like price sensitivity in the enterprise that isn't necessarily real. Mm -hmm. It is very common to see founders underprice enterprise products. And there's a there's a mentality in enterprise that's very different that if you come in with a low price product, they actually get concerned. They're like, mm. what's wrong with this? <laughs> why, why is this so, so cheap? You so, know? So do you so do you start so you don't start with pricing, you really do start with how are my customer sets best able to buy my product and yeah. then work backwards from there? Because Absolutely. if you if you have to fly around and be in boardrooms all over the world and um, and map the uh, organizations and across all your five, Fortune 500 companies, yeah. that's going to be expensive sales motion. Yes. You need to be able to have a pricing that can make that economic. That's right, and you should think about the cycle on the cycle time on those as well. You know, we uh, this is a, a an interesting aspect of the Vanta business. We sell in all segments now. And what we see is very standard, which is the sales cycle, the time it takes to close a deal with a small company is quite short, like less than a month. The sales cycle in the enterprise is, is much longer, it's six to 12 months, and that's actually short for enterprise. Mm -hmm. So what you should expect is if you're gonna try to sell to a startup, you might be able to do that in 30 days. If you're gonna sell to an enterprise, for a complex product, that can be 12 to 24 months, and that's normal. Yeah. So you have to really think about the dynamics of, like, how does that map to what you're trying to accomplish from a revenue perspective? And yeah. those deals can be much, much bigger, it can be a magnitude bigger, but you know, it also plays to like, how are you gonna focus your sales reps and what are you asking them to do? Mm -hmm. If it's a long cycle, you might want to goal them on activity yeah. because you're getting them to set meetings and like drive the start of that process. Where if it's, it's it's selling to small companies, a quota might be more appropriate earlier on because they can drive dollars fast. Oh, that's good. Uh, that's uh, I think that's uh, the, the 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 question of pricing. I think is one that comes up more than just about any question for our mm -hmm. in particular. And I don't. I've never known a founder who hasn't 
severely underpriced their product. Right? Yep. It's almost <laughs> always in one direction. Yep. And I think, honestly, I think that's because a lot of founders uh, were there at the beginning and they saw the product when when it was really just pretty crappy. And, yes. the, and they can't sort of extract themselves from that perspective and put themselves in the shoes of the customers who's buying from a value proposition that they haven't seen the history of. Um, but um, but uh, it really does drive so many of the decisions you can make on the on the sales uh, motion and yeah. how much you're actually charging. On a similar thing, we had a question here from Justin, who's a, a company called Me and You, um, uh, around um, the channel versus direct mm -hmm. sales approach, and, and it's a sort of a general question. But um, where, how do you think about involving channel partners? At yeah. what stage in the development? Do you bring them on first? Do you tend to bring them on later? Um, how do you attract them? How do you get them primed? Any, any yes, this is uh, another a huge area of investment at Vanta, actually. We're, we started building our channel business about a year ago, so we're, we're right in the thick of this. Again, this comes down to like the expectations of your buyer. So is your buyer uh, of the persona that expects to procure things directly? Mm. Do they have a network of trusted partners? And this is often going to depend on the vertical you're operating in. It's going to depend on industry standards, the size of company. You know, we in security compliance, we see a really interesting dynamic here. Um, what we see is that startups, some of them want help from a partner, but they usually want to procure directly. Mm -hmm. In the middle market, we see them actually want to buy through either like a reseller or an MSP. Mm -hmm. And then as you get to the top of the market, our largest enterprise customers, they go back to wanting to either procure directly or through like AWS or another cloud provider as a channel. Mm -hmm. So like it really depends what segment you're trying to target and what is normal in your vertical. The best way to find that out is to just ask. Mm -hmm. You know, this comes back to discovery. Like we sell the CISOs. And we are frequently asking, how do you actually want to buy? Do you have a trusted partner you work with? And then the key will be figure out what that network is. There's usually like a whisper network of trusted partners. You want to be able to sort of get into that network. The value prop to those partners is very, very different. So the example would be at Vanta, our direct value prop might be, we're going to get you compliant and unlock revenue growth. Mm. The value prop to our partner is, hey, we are going to help you build a repeatable revenue stream. Mm. You know, for us, MSPs are partners. There's a lot of PE activity in MSPs. So they're looking for efficient revenue streams that are recurring mm. and growth. And so we've got to focus our value prop very differently when we're talking to the channel partner. Like, of course, they care we have a good product, but they just want to know they can build a business with it, which is very different than our direct value problem. Mm, yeah, the, 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 I think the, the recurring theme that, that, I, that I keep picking up on is this thing that I think will resonate with most founders, which is understand how you are, be very customer centric when it comes to the buying methodology, yes. what, how they buy, how they like to buy, try and fit within that. Don't you may try be, to change it. <laughs> yeah, you may be changing your industry from a product perspective, uh -huh. but you're equally focused on what the customer needs. They are extremely, I think that the reason it'll resonate with most founders is because they are almost by definition going to be very customer centric in terms of the product they're building. You have to take that same customer centricity and think about how they buy products as well and try and exactly. fit within that mold, be it a channel provider or a or direct uh, mm -hmm. customers. Um, the interesting question from Simon at Frankie One, which was about Twilio in particular, and mm -hmm. um, and specifically around consumption based pricing. Mm -hmm. We talked about pricing overall, but um, most of the founders here will be on sort of license or per se models. Um, consumption based businesses like Twilio have a different pricing mechanism. Yeah. Anything that is unique to that sort of pricing mechanism that would change the way you do go to market? A lot, yeah. We uh, we learned a lot at Twilio about how to do that. So when I I joined Twilio pre-IPO, mm. but it was 200 million in ARR at that point. And that was completely PLG. So all consumption based, no committed contracts at that point. Mm. And the mandate at that point was build an enterprise business. Enterprises really struggle with consumption based pricing uh, because typically you think about how an enterprise works and how they buy, they are getting a budget typically pre-approved a year in advance, maybe more. Yeah. They need predictability. Yeah, scares the shit out of them. Yeah. yeah. And they're like, you know, somebody's job might be on the line if they like accidentally send too many text messages and like run up a huge bill. It's kind of an absurd problem, but we actually ran into that a mm -hmm. lot. And so what we learned through that process was we created um one cost control mechanisms in the product 
that would give an enterprise buyer more control. So they could say, like, here's my threshold, like, don't allow me to spend more than this. Yeah. So you kind of have to give an enterprise buyer uh, who's in this kind of consumption setup, because we couldn't not do consumption. That's, you know, there were cogs underlying it we had to think about. Mm. So we gave them more control um, in, in a very mechanistic kind of way. And then we created a model for those contracts that were like based on a minimum guarantee. Yep. So you would uh, tee up a relationship and say, okay, here's your use case. We would model with them in a spreadsheet. Here's what we expect you to spend mm -hmm. based on your intended consumption this year. We'd ask them to commit to a monthly minimum guarantee on a 12 month minimum. Then you've got a committed recurring contract, which is good for you as a business mm -hmm. because then it's ARR. It's not just like wild consumption that's gonna mm -hmm. go up and down. You've got a minimum threshold of ARR there. And then we would go back and uh, recognize how accurate that was over time. So if we expected them to spend, you know, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a month, we'd ask them to maybe commit to $12,000 a month, and then they could spend beyond that if they so choose. So that committed structure ended up working really well. What we later learned too, is that we could add more like real subscription products to that mix that weren't consumption based. Right. Okay. So then it became, yeah, like a blend of a consumption thing. But then we added to that an enterprise SKU that was a bundle of enterprise features. And that was a like a monthly subscription fee that was just a flat fee regardless of consumption. Mm -hmm. And so all those things together started to feel like more of a, like we get ELAs put together and like more uh, like, enterprise contracts mm. and uh that made, so made them more, more comfortable, comfortable and yeah. it was good for the business um that's that's fascinating the um the the, the i'm gonna switch gears a little bit before we get to some of the really tactical stuff there's there's still one big strategic question a lot of australian kiwi companies mm -hmm. face in particular and this question is coming from tony which is how do you think about us market entry now you're coming in the opposite way you've, yeah. you've done a great job of entering this right new zealand market so many of our companies are thinking about making their first steps overseas. Many of them have been selling global customers from the very beginning. Um, some of the enterprise software companies might get their first couple of customers here and then start to make a push overseas. You've been involved with companies doing that into the US. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts around where, how, at what point during the journey, how do you go about US market entry? where you would set up a team if you were going to do that? Yeah, and I think it has changed a lot over the last couple of years. Definitely the pandemic shifted some of those dynamics. I think that, you know, the right time is when there's opportunity for your product. I think you'll find that, you know, U.S. companies are, like, really just looking for the best software and they're willing to buy from anywhere. So I would start the motion from here. Don't think you have to like land boots on the ground in the U.S. to start selling in the U.S. Like you can sell from here and succeed. Um, it, it's really just about like if you've got messaging, you've got a compelling value prop, you can do it. Once you get a certain amount of traction, it is really important to have boots on the ground. I think the thing that has changed is, uh, you know, we see now that it used to be really it was very important to come to the West Coast. Mm -hmm. I think that's less true now. I think you can actually, we're seeing, uh, especially like European founders landing much more often in New York these days. Mm -hmm. I think you can land, frankly, anywhere, but like either coast and do quite well. Um, you know, it really comes down to, I would think about what, uh, again, like a lot of buyer empathy, like what vertical are you operating in and where is there already momentum around that vertical in the US? And mm -hmm. often you'll find there are communities that are more focused on specific verticals, specific stages, and then I, I would go to where there's like a hot spot for that mm -hmm. because there's so much on the ground community that you could be a part of and take advantage of. So if you're thinking financial services, you probably want to go to New York. If you're thinking more, you want to sell to like startup community and tech, I would go to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to sell more into like a, a, entertainment and content, probably go to LA. Mm -hmm. So I think it can be much more vertical. So I think a lot of founders think about how to localize their product um, for, for new market entry, mm -hmm. but perhaps less so how to localize their go-to-market approach and yeah. their team. Mm -hmm. And I've got founders in my portfolio that have US phone numbers, even though they're maybe based here just to make look and feel like a more of a US company. Any tips, tactics you've seen when you're going yeah. to new markets to it, make it feel more local? That matters. So the local phone number matters. It seems silly, but it really does matter quite a lot. You know, I think that um, you can get a tremendous advantage by investing in in-person meetings these days. Mm -hmm. I think that the pandemic made everybody very comfortable over Zoom, almost too comfortable. Yeah. 
and get, the, on, the plane, yeah, get on the plane, get your, we have saying in sales, get your face in the place, get your face in the place, meet people in person. It is shocking how much that will accelerate your success. And it doesn't have to be extensive. It could be go over once a quarter and just spend a week and like get as many meetings as you can. You don't have to be there permanently, but showing up really does matter. Mm. And the other would be just, you know, being accessible, like, there's a, a real desire to sort of break outside of the formal mechanisms of communication in the U.S. So get people on Slack, put them in a Slack channel, give them access to you. If they've got more direct access, they'll kind of stop caring where you're based. Mm -hmm. um, so they'll quickly get over that initial hurdle. Interesting. And uh, and so sort of while, while we're on the on the more, more tactical mm -hmm. piece of this, um, I've got a bunch of questions that are popping in um, that are very sort of specific and tactical around this. But while we're on the, the U.S. piece, I, Something I, I've seen so many times in my career is companies that are based outside of the US who are moving into the US and making their first US sales side. It's actually, in my experience, it's been easier for Australians. So I think there's a real cultural similarity yeah. in there. Mm -hmm. I, 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 before I was at Airtree, I was at a VC in Europe, and we'd work with all these Spanish or French or other founders, and they're making their first hires in the US. And yeah. I remember vividly that the, the, the founder would always go over and come back and say, I've just I've just interviewed five of the greatest salespeople you'll ever meet. <laughs> uh -huh. And you have to sort of sit them down and say, okay, one, they're salespeople, two, they're Americans. Yep. And you're going to have to sort of try and understand really what is a great salesperson yeah. when, you, when you do meet them. And there's a real cultural element to that. So um, so as an American self, um, when you, if you were to be coaching Australian founders or Kiwi founders going over, yeah. um, how would you, and this is a great question from Peter, actually, it just got straight, Peter Secure Code Warrior, which is an enterprise uh, cybersecurity company, mm -hmm. um, got straight to the point. What is the number one question you would ask a CRO oh. if you're looking for one in the US? A CRO is a, di a whole different ballgame. I mean, I would say the probably the number one question, question I would ask a CRO would be, how would you approach deciding whether or not to grow your team? Mm, um, and what you want to hear there is very math based. CROs have to be grounded in the reality of a math based demand model and like an understanding of what it looks like to make a scaling team successful. Yeah. And that all comes back to the math. So, you know, you'll hear a lot of like, uh, Sierra's running on vibes and feelings, <laughs> like huge red flag. Like yeah. it's got to be math. We and uh, say we want to get to this set level of efficiency. Yep. I want my CAC pay back here. I want to be yep. eighty percent of my reps are in quota. That sort of. And you want to you want them asking questions about like where is the demand coming from? What percentage is going to be outbound versus inbound? Like how do you think about uh, how you're going to continue to scale demand? What gives you confidence that's going to work? Mm. So you want them to have a real handle on the levers and mechanics. Mm. And that is always a green flag because if they get that math, they'll go figure it out. Like the details are a little less important, yep. but the, if, if it, a lot of CROs actually don't have a handle on that math and that's where you want to keep an eye out on the sort of how you should think about talent, especially if it's not CRO, but it's salespeople. Mm. I would actually encourage you to hire salespeople here and then move them there yeah. with you. Yeah. You know, I actually think, I think it's very easy to get sort of bamboozled by like, to your point, American salespeople who probably sound really good on first interview, but like they're it, it, that cultural divide and the distance makes it so hard. Yep. I think you've got to have a period of being together in the same place, whether you do that here or there, mm. to make them successful. It's very hard to do that across an ocean. I think it's a great point. I've had lots of founders that have moved people across, figured out, a, and and there are there is no shortage of young salespeople who yeah. want to spend some time in the, in the states, and so if they know their product. Presumably, you've already got a good sense of whether or not they are a national salesperson. Yes. It's the early days, that's really what you need. And I think one of the challenges that I've seen for non US founders is they go across and they interview five of those more coin operators mm -hmm. and they have gilded CVs with all the greatest names in uh, in sales on there, but don't have that sort of um, two way information flow back to the uh, yeah. team and founder. Well, and frankly, that kind of resume does not mean they are good necessarily. You know, there are at these incredibly successful tech companies, there is a whole range of salespeople mm. from really skilled and really talented to honestly terrible. And, you know, it, depending on the culture, folks can live on inbound demand for a long time. So, you know, as you interview, I, I would say one of the areas you really want to dig into, whether you're bringing that person or interviewing somebody 
uh, in the States is you want to dig into like, where did their opportunities come from? Did they source them themselves? Are they hunters? Like, did they, how much of that was inbound? And, you know, what were their win rates? You want them to be able to really articulate how they succeeded mm. uh, because they're just, you know, there are a lot of people that have uh, been along for the ride at great companies and seen tremendous success, but they are not going to be able to generate that success on their own. Yep. So this is actually, we're doing the similar thing in reverse, which is we brought some of our really successful American reps to London, to Dublin, and now to Sydney. And they become sort of the the heart of helping the team here that we now hire locally learn mm -hmm. what works in our business. What what is, what is the other differences that you've noticed between, culturally between American and U and Australian? Yes, people? yes, it's really interesting being here this week. I, I would say, um, in a very positive way, the salespeople here are very entrepreneurial and resourceful in a way that I am finding really refreshing. Mm. Um, interesting. And not not to diminish Europe, but it's a little different. I think that like European sales reps have a little bit of the benefit of being like a little closer time zone wise to the U.S. So mm. I think there's a little more of an expectation of support. Mm. Whereas what I'm finding with the team here is that there's sort of this uh, acceptance of like we're we're out here on our own. We kind of know it time zone wise, and so we're just going to figure it out. So I'm seeing there are a lot of Renaissance Renaissance reps here that I think would actually do extremely well in the U.S. Mm, uh, because there's like an entrepreneurial spirit and a creativity that is demanded by the difference in time zone that I think is actually a really good thing and makes them like have potential to perform really well anywhere. And then and 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 assuming you've got a good collection of Renaissance reps and they're and they're starting to, to scale and 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 you're looking at. Um, potentially making promotions from within rather mm -hmm. than getting a sales leader from outside. Um, Will, uh, again, me and you had a good question around how to look at um, uh, your sales team and identify which ones might well be suited to a promotion. Up oh, gosh, this is always a hot topic. It's a really tough one because so many salespeople think the only path to moving up is becoming a manager. Yeah. And I we see this assignment in engineering yeah. standard across the board. It's so tough because it's a very different skill set. I really encourage salespeople to not think that way. There are salespeople that will make great sales managers, no doubt. Yeah. I am equally a believer in the idea that salespeople should it should be a terminal career in that you should be able to continue to advance as a salesperson and never become a manager, but still have a fulfilling career where you continue to move up. Yep. So I, I'm a big fan of both of those paths. People who would do well in the manager role have to genuinely like managing people. That sounds obvious, but I think salespeople often think like, oh, manager next step. The truth is in a sales manager role, you're typically making less money than your top salespeople. Yep. And as their manager, you know that because you see what your reps are making. And so you have to have a real passion for it and, you, and a need and a want to develop people in that way. So, you know, if you see someone who is stepping up and starting to act more like a team lead, starting to teach their peers best practices, that is usually a really good signal that that person could become a manager. Mm. If you see a top rep who's just really great and crushing their number, but they're kind of a lone wolf, do not make that person a manager. Yeah. And, you know, best practice from my perspective as you're growing is you want about 50-50. So 50% internal promotion, 50% external hire. Like if you go too far one way or the other, you just, you can get like too insular and like too focused on how things work today, or you can just break the system. So you want to get a good balance. You're not bringing in ideas from outside of it. Yeah. It's really healthy to do that. That's really interesting. Great, great um, tactical suggestion. What's... Um, there's a bunch, bunch of questions coming in around the sort of general topic around compensation plans, mm -hmm. which is... Probably something you spend a lot of time yes. thinking about. Um, <laughs> different plans will work for different companies, but how do you think through a blank sheet of paper, new company coming in? How do I sort of start to structure? What are the what are the levers I have a play, and how do I think yeah. about starting a competition structure? I really think like I'm very passionate about the idea that you should have variable compensation from day one. Mm -hmm. Not every company does it that way, but I think it's important. Like you want a salesperson to be driven by those outcomes. Now, you also want to be cautious that you don't, you'll have salespeople interview and they'll want you to commit very early to like a lot of detail around the compensation plan. That's also actually a red flag mm -hmm. because to get comfortable in a startup where things are very dynamic, you need somebody who is driven by variable compensation, but not 
seeking like the certainty around it. Like they're willing to bet on themselves. If, if you see that flag, you're good. So I really like 50, 50. So if you're setting someone up on a variable plan, um, you set it up such that 50% of their compensation is base salary. They get it no matter what. 50% is variable. Mm -hmm. That total amount we call OTE on target earnings. And, you know, I like early days, I like the period of compensation to be short. So ideally like monthly or worst case quarterly. Mm -hmm. And I would, t you can tie that uh, compensation to anything, you know, it could be logos, it could be activity, mm -hmm. uh, or it could be dollars. It really depends where you're at. And it doesn't so much matter what it is, as long as you're clear about it. And ideally, you want it tied to very few metrics. Best case scenario, you're tying that variable compensation to a single metric. Yep. Worst case, I wouldn't do more than two. If you start to make it like too complicated, people lose the plot and it loses like all of its ability to motivate behavior. Yep. And what those metrics are will really depend around the, yeah. the, the type of model you're trying to build, the type of product you've got. We've had founders that do that just on, on straight um, ARR. We've had yeah. founders that do it on renewals as well. We've done founders that do a, 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 a kicker for new sales where you're trying to get new logos in the door. I love that model well. actually. Yeah. It said that's one way that like two metrics can do really well is you could do dollars but if it's dollars from a new logo, maybe you get twice as much credit for that versus dollars from an existing logo. So yeah. there's some interesting things you can do. Account managers are another interesting one. I've just built an account management function at Banta. They are selling uh, to our existing customer base. Mm -hmm. They're actually compensated in our business on uh, net retention. So they have to retain the customer and upsell and expand. And so they get compensated on that NRR number. Do they get an additional uh, um, comp? If you just get a retention, 100% retention? It's, that... no. So it's just NRR. So, so, you know, everybody makes their number a little bit of a different way. Some people are stronger on gross retention. Other mm -hmm. people are very sales-minded and they go heavier on expansion. Yep. And we wanted to give them the flexibility to play to their strengths. So they can hit it either way, but they've got one number and it's net retention. Interesting. Okay. Um, it, it's also a, a common trap I see founders falling into is, not doing a sufficiently good job of tying conversation into cash in the deal. Yes. Um, they, they tend to be comping people for, um, you know, potentially a three-year contract value yeah. when you're not actually getting that money. And it may be contractually obliged, but, you, but you've got to really sort of think about um, your cash flows when it comes to equity compensation. It is absolutely critical. And it's, it, like if you've got a consumption-based business, this is always a huge risk because you say, oh, well, we brought in a million-dollar customer. But if it's consumption based and that's not committed, you could get yourself in a huge hole where you pay your salesperson this huge check on commission and then yeah. like customer never realizes the usage or whatever it may be. So yeah, like pay attention to terms early yeah. is another mistake. It ties to compensation, but it also just ties to like cash flow management. Just to go on that, that um, yeah. Andrew, Frankie one again, had a question on that for the, for the um, uh, sales commission plans for consumption models. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? <laughs> there is no one right answer. Mm. The safe answer is to pay once the uh, usage comes in, yep. in arrears. And ideally, you don't want to wait long. So, uh, you know, we yep. have, I've seen this done. You get paid at the end of the month based on actual consumption in the month. Sometimes that can be tough because, you know, you have a consumption business. Sometimes that usage will ramp and maybe it ramps over two years. So yeah. a salesperson might bring in a very material deal, but the real usage is 18 months out. Yeah. And that can be hard. So ideally, you're finding a way to structure a commitment in that because it de-risks paying your salespeople. Mm. Um, so you want to kind of think about, is there a contractual structure that like protects your business? So if you're going to pay salespeople earlier, mm. you're in a position to do so without risking. So... Like that is the way I would do it as yeah. like a, a committed contract. If it has to be cons consumption based, I would just be really careful and upfront with your sellers. And in that case, maybe you do two metrics, you pay on consumption in real time based in reality, but then maybe you're paying them like a, a flat amount for every logo sign up or something like that. So they get okay. something earlier. Yeah, yeah, and there's definitely additional challenges yeah. when, you can, when you haven't got a predictable streams. Um, we, we touched a little bit around org structure, the AU teams. Um, I had a question from Jason, which is around um, 
what role does a sales enablement team mm -hmm. um, and, and when you would bring that into the function. But I, I, let's make that broader. Like how do yeah. you think about the organizational design, SDRs, AE, sales enablement within a sales team? Yeah, I, I think that really you want to keep it simple early days. And I wouldn't start to add additional functions until that first core of a team gets overwhelmed, frankly. So when you start out with AEs, you would expect them to be really handling their own enablement in a lot of ways and within in partnership with the founders. You also would want them to sort of be their own SDR early on. Mm. They're building you, their own collateral in the early days? Yeah, early days, you really do. Like it's it's it, it can be really easy to say, oh, well, we need these 10 functions and suddenly we've got a team of 10 people, but like only one or two of them are actually driving revenue. So like really think about efficiency. And, you know, as those two first reps start to get productive, you'll start to see what else matters. And then it's about optimizing outcomes. So you should think about adding another function when that function can materially move the metrics of the business. Not because it's nice to have, but like for me, I add enablement when I believe enablement can increase rep productivity in a material enough way that it's actually a positive ROI in the business. And that, so that's going to be a bigger team size before it would actually add that head. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and, um, uh, while we're on sales enablement, that, that, that encapsulated a lot of the questions around sales tools and mm -hmm. all that, this comes in through sales enablement teams. Um, have you seen anything really exciting in terms of tools for driving leads or, or doing sales enablement generally, AI yeah. or otherwise? Yes, definitely. So there, it, we're at this interesting point where there are just millions of new AI-powered nice. sales tools. There's some really good stuff out there, but there's a lot of noise as well. So I would say, you know, there are uh, there's one actually I'm an investor in called Clay. Um, Clay is really interesting. They're doing um, a combination of like aggregation of data enrichment and then AI powered workflows on the back of that. So I think where there's a lot of noise right now is around like personalization. Everybody's trying to conquer the SDR game from an AI perspective. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of noise and like, I haven't seen a ton of execution on the promise yet. I think it's hard to do. Um, so I would say, don't be bamboozled by like all the the flashy stuff, really get down to nuts and bolts. And at the end of the day, like it's about high quality data and personalized, interesting outreach that reaches the right buyer. So you really don't need anything super complex for that. Mm -hmm. Like keep it simple early days, and then you optimize around the edges from there. Mm -hmm. Any um, any tips on um, any other sort of the base software that you use? Anything you yeah. love? Anything you hate? CRM? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm like a big Salesforce person. You know, I think don't overdo it, but like Salesforce yeah. does the job. You got to have some don't CRM. Don't overthink your CRM. Yeah, don't overthink your CRM. It's there's, there's there's no real magic there yet. Hopefully that'll be different someday. But like, you know, you just have to have a system of record that everyone uses. You got to agree where things live and then you're good to go. You know, outside of that, we use like the typical best in class stack right now, which would be outreach typically for outbound emails. We're using Gong as pretty much everybody on earth is at this point. Um, we're using Clary. Clary is a really interesting tool there are, you know, Gong has some of this functionality as well, but because we're a very high velocity business, uh, the AI and algorithmic aspects of Clary and how, how it helps us analyze our forecasts, that we found really, really useful. Okay. So that's been a great one. I mean, we're using a lot of the other, you know, Sixth Sense for intent data. G2 has some decent intent data, some of that, but it's other than that, it's pretty strand, standard stack. Uh, um, we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, one very technical question around forecasting. Yeah. Um, when you when you're doing your sit, sit downs with the team, you're doing your quarterly forecasting. What is what is the uh, methodology look like? What have you seen work? What have yeah. you really not work? So to me, this is my single biggest responsibility as a revenue leader is to run an operational cadence that is high rigor, and I run it weekly. Mm -hmm. So best practice would be have a regular weekly cadence. Don't let it go to a month. Don't let it go to a quarter. Like run it every week. Take it as an opportunity to look at the numbers, but you really want to inspect the details of the deals. Mm -hmm. So you want to get to starting to think about a med pick framework and like, how much do we actually know about our top deals? Call a number. And then the next week you want to look at, were we right? Were we wrong? And what did we miss? Mm -hmm. If you do that, you can build essentially like a self-healing machine where you start to learn every week 
what did we do well? What did we miss? And how can we do it better? But you've got to have the repeatability in that and then hold yourself accountable to that and report it out to the rest of your organization because that's how you keep yourself honest. That math and measuring it every week is the same. And is that every week still measuring your um, your expectation for the end of the quarter or are you literally doing it, here's what we expect this week to fall? Depends on your business. So um, for Vance is a great example. I run a monthly cadence for my business, but I run a forecast every week. So every week we're calling a monthly and a quarterly forecast. Mm -hmm. And then we're looking at how do we do as we close each month. So, you know, we're uh, we're in uh, June right now. We're calling a June forecast and we're calling a Q2 forecast. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the month, we're closing out. Like, how did we do? Was it accurate? And then we're updating every week. Like, is forecast up? Is it down? What changed? Then we're reading conditions from there. It gives us a chance to diagnose and address issues in the moment. I was going to say we had probably time for one more question, but I'm not sure we do actually. So I'm going to I'm going to um, be conscious of everybody's time, and I wanted to make sure see if we had a chance to um, give one final um, plug uh, for what you're down here in Australia, yeah. doing, which, which which is helping um, sell uh, more compliance software. Absolutely. Um, do, I think we've talked about um, how valuable this is to so many of our startups. There's a lot of startups out there as well. Is there anything that you want to um, chat about or? Uh, uh, point them in any direction to come and find out more about Bend. Absolutely. So a couple of things I would say to that is startups are absolutely our bread and butter. We have grown tremendously at market as well. So a really exciting part of our business <laughs> is that we're now serving mid-market companies and enterprises. So we are helping streamline security reviews. We are essentially acting as like a modern GRC platform for mid-market companies. So, uh, you know, excited to work with every size of company in the market, uh, we're growing here. We'd love to partner with folks. I think we've got real opportunity in market to partner with tech partners who we can integrate with to you know, really expand the ecosystem here. So would love to see you all like at Vanta.com is where to find us. I'm super active on LinkedIn. Would love to connect with people there. Um, and we're right here in the CBD in Sydney. So anybody that wants to come by and say hi, we're always game to connect and just talk best practices as well. Fantastic. And we'll send around a, a, a link with, a, uh, I think, a discount code on the back of it as well. So um, welcome to come and uh, chat to the team and, yes. uh, and learn more about Vanta. Thank you, Stevie. Thank you so much. Thank Hopefully uh, that's been really helpful for all the sales leaders and founders on the call here. Hopefully you all uh, now uh, know why Stevie would be in my absolute number one <laughs> draft pick for my fantasy league football team of uh, sales you. leaders i'll take it god help me if that actually exists i'm sure it does somewhere <laughs> in the us uh, but thank you so much for your time it's great to see you and thank you everyone for joining